Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric. I'm here with Michael, who watched two films today. I did. And now we are bringing the two films to the audience. Mm -hmm. What were the two films we did today? Uh, we watched Willard and the McVeigh tapes. So this is another kind of weird one. Uh -huh. um, you know, we have Willard, uh, Crispin Glover. I mean, you've uh, right. wanted to do this on the show for a while. And we have the McVeigh tapes. I'm not sure that both of these films... Uh, I don't. I'm, I'm not sure there's any link whatsoever. Not so much. But in true documentary form on this show, uh, when you have something like the McVeigh tapes, I mean, you know, we could. It's kind of heavy. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's domestic terrorism, and there's certainly other documentaries about domestic terrorism and stuff. Well, you know, I mean, we covered Waco. Right. I'm sure that'll come up a little bit. And I've expressed before that Columbine is something I have interested in, have interest in rather. But I, I don't think it's a good idea to put too heavy domestic terrorism. Right, exactly. You know what I mean? Sure. It's just for sure such a bummer. So we need to lighten the mood, but we needed to do that in a way that didn't just make light of right. Oklahoma City. Exactly. Uh, I thought about something like Die Hard. You uh -huh. know what I mean? And that's just there's it's so tasteless. Yeah, you're shaking your head at me right now. Even even the mere mention. But as we're pairing up double features, it's it's kind of you know what do we do here? Uh -huh. How do we put this together? And we just need to talk about Willard and be okay with that, and yep. then talk about the McVeigh tapes in a completely separate uh, escape from L.A. religious kind right. of exactly conversation. So um, we are going to spoil both of the films. Obviously, one's a documentary. Uh, but we're going to spoil Willard. I mean, uh, you would say Willard is pretty spoilable. Oh, yeah, for right? sure. There are definitely certain beats to the story that we're going to have to talk about. And you can use the chapters embedded in the show to skip. Uh, say you haven't seen Willard yet. You want to come back to that and I could spoil. You can skip over the McVeigh tapes. Or if you get to the McVeigh tapes and it's bumming you out, you can skip to the end of the show. And we'll talk about what we're doing next time. Willard has a really interesting opening. Yeah. What is this credit sequence about? It's like a, it's kind of a weird lemony snicket yeah. kind of, yeah. it's almost like the beginning of a dark children's movie Yeah, where there's weird moving paintings of all the actors that kind of get slid in, yeah. or at least Crispin Glover's character. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of stop motion skeletons moving in a big Danny Elfman-esque score. Yeah, some live action rats going on there. It's very weird. Yeah, this thing has Danny Elfman all over it. I, I think it even kind of has that early Tim Burton feel. Yeah. You know, part of that might just be the stop motion stuff, little kind of yeah. Nightmare Before Christmas sort of thing. But even to go back to uh, something like Beetlejuice mm -hmm. or uh, maybe not Beetlejuice. I know that's kind of the model opening or whatever. But Edward Scissorhands, you yeah. know, to have that um, that sort of feel to it. Just really dark stuff, and then it doesn't help when the Elfman score comes yeah. in. So this is not Danny Elfman right. doing the score. Right. But this is, um, it's kind of like when we were uh, talking about Leprechaun, and, uh, you know, the, yeah. the what was that? Photos of you, right? Uh, yeah, photos of you. Which is just uh, a quick way to reference any kind of, when you, when you don't want to license music for your film, or you can't get the rights, or it's expensive, or whatever. You just have music that sounds eerily similar to whatever. Uh -huh. And yeah, it, it's... Danny Elfman the whole way through. It's not Danny Elfman, but it kind of is. Right. And that's not just the opening title sequence, which is more fun than the rest yeah. of the film. But I think this movie could have easily been a very typical horror film. And the score, it really lightens the mood, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it does. It does. It's, uh, I mean, right from, you have what, that opening shopping scene? Yeah. Which, it, what is, yeah. Uh, what's the thing that he's trying to get? So, all right. So, Crispin Glover's character, Willard, uh -huh. uh, he has to go investigate some rats uh -huh. in the basement because right. mother wants him mm -hmm. to go down there and take a look at that. And they cut immediately to this this great transition of uh, demouse your house. Yeah. And he's shopping for all of the different rodent repellent or the traps or whatever. Um, I think Mouse Prout 2 is what he's yeah. looking for, but it's sold out. I mean, it's just really, uh, maybe whimsical is not the right yeah, word. Well, it's, Bombastic. I mean, I don't even have a word to describe it. Willard is this dark Kafka-esque black hair, white skin, gray suit, no yeah. color. He is, a, he is a gray panel. And he's sitting among what would be considered one of the more colorful aisles of the supermarket. Sure, because right. you have all these bright, let's kill the bug colors. Yep, yep. 
and he's just standing there as if somebody plucked him from the film yep. and went, go here and buy your solution. Right. Not to continue to drop the Tim Burton references, but uh, something like Sweeney Todd, you know, when they're right. on the beach, something that doesn't work at all for that movie. Right. But, uh, you know, I really like seeing Crispin like he's out of a funeral home. Exactly. Standing there as Willard in this this fluorescent bright uh, supermarket. It just makes the whole thing kind of feel like it's going to be a comedy. And then you have these roles that are almost something out of comedy themselves. I mean, look at. All right. So let's look at um, Willard as the protagonist mm-hmm. of the film. The titular character, maybe not the protagonist by the end of the film, which is something that's kind of weird. He's not necessarily a likable character, but the antagonists that surround him are so unlikable that it, I mean, who we have his mom. His mom. So his mom is what? Kind of domineering. Yeah. She, well, she's overbearing and she's been overbearing his whole life. She changes his name in the beginning of the film. She (laughs) decides his new name is Clark Clark. and maybe that'll give him a boy, a girlfriend. And then there's also his boss. Martin. Who is so completely fucking absurd in how to the nines this guy right. is. Well, the thing that's interesting about the film is is if you take those three characters, mm-hmm. they're these characters that seem like they're from another film, another yeah. less serious, more whimsical, you know, yeah. comedic, weird thing. More of this, a comedy, yeah. more of absurdist comedy. Exactly. Kind of. and Maybe like, not even absurdist comedy, but they make this movie absurd right. because they're such strange comedic elements. And you take them and the rest of the film, the rest of the world around them is basking in normalcy. Right. The rest of the people that work there are all just normal people. Mundane, really. And, and the mice behave like mice because right. they're mice. But for some reason, there's these three weird characters that it's almost like the film is instead of going, let's watch these characters unfold. It's kind of like the film is trying to oust them yeah. from its normal yeah. world. The film is manipulating itself to go. These three weirdos must be vanquished. And you need that. Uh, I mean, when you have a story set in that kind of normal town, that's why they can't focus too much on Willard's sort of it. I don't want to call it a love interest, but you know, his, his only human friendship, right? right. I mean, that just serves to make him look more weird. Uh, We don't learn anything about that character. She's not important. She just shows up to sort of represent the audience and say, well, she works at this job where she knows the boss is a dick. She doesn't really know anything about Willard's mom. Uh, And we see her interactions with Willard and it makes him look absolutely crazy. So that's our kind of position as an audience. That's the uh, the point of, I guess, the point of normalcy. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, she's she's kind of the staple that goes, not everyone is a nut job. <laughs> right, right. To remind you that everybody else is completely average in the film, with the exception of these three weirdos. So we get rid of, um, in a really bizarre scene, uh, we get rid of Willard's mother. Yeah. I guess she... The rat's eater? Is that what's yeah, going on here? It's kind of it's kind of left up. You see this interesting arc of of mm-hmm. rat murder. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of begins, you know, it begins innocently enough with with popping expensive vehicle tires. Yeah. And then eventually they scare a puppy. And then they kill a cat. Mm. And then finally Willard's mother is found dead and she's being devoured by all these rats. It's possible she fell down the stairs. It's possible she Maybe died she of slipped on a com- rat. Exactly. She died of completely natural causes. But what matters is not how she died. It matters that upon her death, the rats have decided she's a meal. Yeah. And that's what makes that scene so horrific. And that's what makes that death so iconic as it goes, okay, the first of these weird characters has been devoured by the rats. <laughs> yeah, right. And the rat problem is still growing. I mean, not completely devoured, but right. they show an interest in eating her before mm-hmm. Willard kind of steps in. Um, and then, you know, later when she's embalmed in, in the coffin and uh, presentable, it's it's so weird. When she's alive, she looks more like a corpse exactly. than when she's yeah. in. Well, I mean, obviously, that's the effect they're going for. But it's it, Yeah, it's this cool thing where, again, the film is going weirdo, weirdo, and now she's dead and it's normal. Yep. She becomes a normal person in death. Yeah, she looks a lot like the drag me to hell yeah. woman. You know, while she's alive, while she is uh, alive and calling Willard Clark. So once she's out of the picture, because she's kind of the antagonist, but it's a weird, it's kind of a weird mama's boy sort mm-hmm. of thing. Not the film mama's right. boy, but as if Willard is actually a mama's boy. Um, Asks some really awkward questions about Crispin Glover's bathroom behavior, that sort of thing. 
And once she's out of the picture, everything focuses on his boss, on uh, Mr. Martin. Yeah, we start getting all the close camera angles on his face <laughs> yeah, right. instead of everybody else's face. Well, the camera work. So um, this is the first film by Glenn Morgan. He's a writer primarily. Uh, he's done some stuff for the X Files and then the spinoffs, uh, Millennium and The Lone Gunman. But I think he's a really creative director. Oh yeah, you know, there's a lot that goes into some of the shots. I mean, obviously, there's there's camera operators and cinematographers and and so forth. But uh, just that scene where Crispin, you know, very beginning when they're talking about the rats, and it's a wide shot. It's from far back of Crispin standing there, and he's he's shouting down to his mm-hmm. mother elsewhere in the house. And the camera pushes in on him so close. Once it gets right up on his face, rather than zooming, the camera's actually you know getting physically closer to him. That it almost looks like a fisheye. By mm-hmm. the time you're that close, right? If he stepped forward an inch, he would bump into you know the lens. And that's how the camera shoots a lot of stuff. Oh yeah. I mean, it's not just in zooming in or I guess in getting closer to the subject. It's just. Uh, different angles from uh, doorknobs, stuff that would almost be macro shots. Yeah. It, it's that close. And then I also noticed the camera shoots a lot from these really low angles or even in that scene with Crispin, you know, when in the hallway or whatever, when they get up close to his face, it's at a higher angle right. than you would normally see. Just different ways to make you feel like things are Slightly more... Slightly amiss. Yeah. With these characters. Yeah, with a the characters. A lot of the times when you have the specific... Because the only really other human characters you get are um the people that work at the office yeah and when you're dealing with them it's very standard shots yeah you know people in the desk facing the right of the screen they're slightly bared to the left right, they're right. not centered you know anybody who's talking is just kind of around and they're right, not right in a obscure angle it's right in front of their face slightly below just normal people filming mm-hmm. then you get the the third type of weird filming which is that the rats have <laughs> particularly ben big ben yeah, get some of the most sinister camera because Ben right. is always above, right? And you're always below Ben, looking up, and he's just kind of—it's very ominous, you know. Yeah, he kind of gets this Marlon Brando juts his jaw <laughs> yeah. out, yeah, over the edge, and just kind of you have to deal with whatever he's yeah. watching you right, deal with, right. but he's not going to be a part of it. Yeah, he's a force to be reckoned with. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to believe that. And just the fact that it's a, a wombat instead yeah, of a right. rat is yeah. not enough to, who is only slightly bigger than, uh, you know, than the other rodents. The other thing that camera work is good for is making things seem off when there aren't just a bunch of rats around. Because when Crispin's in the basement, when Willard's in the basement talking to the rats, you know everything is weird. But when he's just walking around the house, things don't seem as weird. So if you shoot them from ridiculously low or high camera angles, it just feels like you're in a place where you wouldn't normally be. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could probably also go as far as to say the low camera angles are a rat's perspective. Right. But I won't be the one to say that. I won't that. either. So Mr. Martin, his boss, is the antagonist for the, the second act of the film. It's mm-hmm. like there's a different antagonist every act of the film. Uh, and this guy is a fucking demon. I mean, so this, the first introduction we get to him, obviously there's conflict with Willard and, and yeah. him at the yeah. job. But he's talking about Willard's money troubles, and the advice he gives him is you should demolish your house and build an apartment complex there. (laughs) As if that's the thing. You know, Willard works at a desk. He pushes papers. I don't know what he does, but it doesn't look too... What, does he sell insurance or something? Yeah, probably. And he's going to build an apartment. That's like, hey, me and you should quit this show and we should demolish the studio. And you know what would be great is if we built a bunch of condos and sold them. Like, what are you talking about? By hand. How does that possibly Apparently, make, yeah, the how does that make any off. sense? Um, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the character being so comedic mm-hmm. without realizing that himself. Right. Also, the thing he yells after Willard, you know, at, at his house yeah. about, r- what is it, run away? or uh, you know, if, if you run away, you're just going to die tired. tired. Yeah, yeah, that's great. It seems as if he realizes, you know, he's just out to get Willard. Right. He doesn't like him. Mm-hmm. It's not even about the job. There's no ulterior motive there. He doesn't even realize. He goes to his deathbed, really, without realizing that it was Willard who slashed mm-hmm. the tires, apparently, and peed on the floor, apparently. He doesn't ever make the connections. It's the rats. So there's no personal vendetta. He just really doesn't like the guy. And there's some bad business with his dad right. or whatever. His dad, by the way, who is... I guess you don't say played by. Right. Uh, who is the appearance of Willard from the, you know, from the original, original film right. before the Ben sequel and now the uh, remake. 
I think that's really weird. They use his likeness of the original actor to play Willard's dad, uh-huh. but Willard's dad is dead. So you only see that actor in portraits and in pictures, mm-hmm. but it's kind of, do you think they had to, to pay for that? I or? don't know how that works. I mean, I the studio owns rights to the original Willard. Right, but I don't right? know if they own his likeness. I don't know how far his likeness But they likeness could use footage to... Yeah, but... They, I, I mean, yeah, I we know. already tagged Leprechaun in this, might as well tag it again, but in the later Leprechaun films, they use footage from the earlier Leprechaun yeah. films. I don't know if they had to pay more money to do that. I don't either. But if they just want to use an act, it's, it's a really strange... Um, I don't know. We need to hunt down somebody who is in charge of licensing his appearance for that uh, and find out. So the other thing about Martin, the boss, Mm -hmm. before his wonderful demise, (laughs) is that the film goes through pain so that you don't like the guy. Yeah. It's not Willard's kind of misunderstood and this guy is is an opponent of his. It's the film goes and says, you are to hate this man. He has no redeeming qualities. He is the devil. Because it's possible that, you know, maybe he's a hard ass at work because he's a serious businessman. Yeah. Then there's the scene where Willard goes and pops the tires at his house. And while the garage door is closing, he yells at his wife, we're not making a fucking bed. You know, be careful. Right. And then finally we we get the final scene where Martin kills Socrates. I mean, Mm. that is that's the moment right there. Yeah. For no reason. Just bludgeons him to death. Poor little guy. And he's super proud of it, mm. ecstatic about it. And then that's well, where and we then can... don't forget that he's also been trying to take Willard's house for no reason. Right. Every time Willard runs into trouble that his boss is making for him, his boss says, "Well, why don't you just give me your house?" And what, what does he want with? It's not like know. there's any reason. Maybe there's an omitted scene where there's gold buried yeah, in his house, well, but the... he has some weird preoccupation with it. The thing is that the three crazy people like the house, and that's yeah. it. They certainly do. And then Martin finally gets what, I mean, it's what you wait for. It's what Mm. the movie kind of boasts the whole time. It's that Willard is the rat whisperer. (laughs) Yeah, right. Uh, And you get what is possibly my favorite scene, which is Martin's murder. Mm -hmm. Starts with loading the truck, just piles of mice. Yeah. Bringing them to the office and the scene where the elevator opens up and it's just pouring mice. Yeah. And Willard's just standing there furious Mm -hmm. they use cg and it's i mean yeah, it looks like hot dogs scurrying along the floor and they use cg in a couple other places we kind of have to say that because i'm sure we'll get a bunch of emails like you didn't talk about the cg yeah right as if that's important at all but the cg it looks bad okay great there you go care of check and martin gets he gets okay so i don't know if you knew this but he puts his hand on a real mouse oh not a computer mouse yeah they really want that joke so bad it's like when we talked about fight club and how yeah. proud it was of the ending they're so proud of that mouse joke where the the camera goes over to his mouse it shows him click it comes back and it shows him click again and everyone knows exactly yeah. what's going to happen and they just keep doing it until he touches the mouse, and it's not nearly as rewarding right. as you as you thought it would be. He goes, ew, and the mouse yep. runs away. Yep. And then he sees the other... He sees the... Are they rats or mice? They're rats. All right. Well, I'm just going to keep calling them rats, and you keep calling them mice, perfect. and our continuity will be perfect. I'll call them wombats from time. Uh, <laughs> that'll be great. So we'll get to some wombat action in the third act of this film. But yeah, he looks over and sees the rats... And, you know, we get this awesome moment that you described of the rats pouring out of the elevator and Willard looking down from Mm -hmm. under his brow. But uh, he's not, uh, his boss isn't nearly as impressed by all these rats as Willard is. Willard says, they listen to me. I'm their leader. And he goes, well, get them out of here. Yeah, make them leave. I don't need any rats here. He, He, this is not a spectacle for him at all. He does not care. It's not until Willard starts using his I'm upset voice right. that he really sits down. So we didn't really talk about the character of Willard. Um, I mentioned that he's only likable by comparison and that he kind of brings all of these problems on himself. I mean, that's a, that is a core element of understanding the fable of Willard is that Willard, all of his problems, are, he shows up late to work. He yeah. kind of makes his boss angry. He shows up late and, to work. He won't sell the house when that's clearly the best yeah. financial option. Yeah, and He chooses he, mice over women. I yep. mean, yeah, you, you're right. All He's, his problems are caused by himself. It's be, Yeah, well, again, I, I keep going back to this, but I think it's a strong theme that he's just, oh, he's, an, he's not, he's been delved into the wrong world. Mm-hmm. His character would fit in stunningly. He would be an attractive character in a different film (laughs) another time and place he's somehow been thrust into the real world and Mm -hmm. that's not where he belongs is that great line from sin city about marv if he were born in the time of gladiators you know he would be king there instead of here where he's in a shitty bar right Uh, but that is willard that is absolutely willard Uh, he makes these choices to alienate himself i guess to isolate himself from the rest of society 
and make the rats his friends. I think Crispin plays that really well. You can tell that he's tightly wound. It's as if right from the beginning, he could snap at absolutely any moment. You have to believe that he has that aggression, but you also have to believe how shy he is. And I don't think that's any easy task. You know, this has to be the same kind of guy who could live with his mother like he does, who could be dominated by his boss, but who could also control an almost supernatural flood Right. of uh of rats to have that aggression and i think one of the things i like most about crispin's performance is that when he gets aggressive he doesn't become a badass i mean his voice cracks right. he squeals he, he shakes, sounds he's yeah. not he's he's almost uncomfortable with himself yeah, it's right. it's kind of like the shy character is still there mm-hmm. he's just now also afraid of himself so let's talk about the relationship he has with these rats first one is socrates the uh the white one And from Socrates come all of these other rats. It almost makes me kind of wonder how he operated in society without the rats, because it seems like that's the the only, I almost said the only person he talks to. But you know what I mean? The only, it's, it's anthropomorphizing. Socrates is his only friend. And the other rats show up, and I have a hard time telling if he likes the other rats or not. You know, it seems like Socrates is the only one whose company he enjoys. The rest of the rats are a tool for him. Yeah. They are a a means to an end. He's just going to shut them all in the basement. I mean, we see that as soon as, you know, the deed is done with his boss, he comes back and he kills all the rats. He has no interest in them. Right. It's just Socrates. And that's where the problems come in with the wombat. Yeah. So Ben is is the wombat rat. Mm -hmm. He's the giant one. He gets his own sequel in the original version of the film. Yeah. So amazingly, and and I don't want to get into this too much, but they did a damn good job using live action animals. Yeah, they didn't have to, and not only did they do it, but they pulled it off spectacularly. Yeah, for it's sure. almost like their characters. Well, the scene where he's laying there uh, on the bed talking to Socrates the first time, right? And just that shot of Crispin's weird fucking face, the, the like profile. profile, and then the rat is just staring right at him. And I'm almost thinking, well, that that stupid fucking rodent is so well behaved; it's got to be a prop. But then it kind of turns and moves as the mm-hmm. the camera moves away. Uh, just to see, I mean, their faces can't really emote. It kind of, you know, it's the thing you said before about that ominous, uh, godfather like yeah. position in looking at Ben, you have to show him in a way that says something about him because he can't speak or change his express. He doesn't do anything but twitch. Right. He's a fucking, you know, wombat. Right. right. So Ben becomes the antagonist. Ben, yeah. it, it now has come down to Willard being the last surviving weirdo and, Essentially what happens is it's Willard versus Ben in control of the rodents. And unfortunately, Willard shows his hand when he kills a large amount of them and then puts them in a burning barrel. So Ben comes back with a vengeance from the office. The house gets flooded with rats. The police are trying to get in. Willard's trying to get out. Catherine's trying to just talk to somebody. Yeah. And eventually Willard realizes that the only way he's going to get out is if he can destroy Ben and find barless windows, which happen to be in the steeple of his <laughs> right. much coveted home. Yeah. And upon severing Ben's paw in a in a really poor He puts a bag full a- of <laughs> rat traps on him, right? I mean that's, Essentially, yeah. yeah. He pours a bag of rat traps on him. I would argue with you uh here, just you know, maybe it's a semantic point, but maybe not. I think that the rats, and specifically Ben, are the protagonists at this point. I feel like Willard, I mean, you kind of mentioned that in the way you're talking about it. Here are the three weirdos. We've killed mom, we've killed his boss, and now it's Willard, and he's the one that's left, and he betrayed the rats. You, of course, have to really anthropomorphize to feel like you can betray a pack of rats. But he betrays the rats, well, and I'm almost rooting for Ben at that point. Well, the other thing about betraying the rats is Willard has... We we need to take a step back here. Willard has also <laughs> killed somebody. Right. I mean, granted, he controlled the rats to make them kill, but coming mm-hmm. I mean, by proxy. Yeah. Come on. So Willard is now a criminal, mm-hmm. and rats can't be criminals. As we're clearly drawing to a close on our conversation, I just wonder if you're trying to paint me into a corner so I'm going to have one of those bad news transitions, oh. you know, to talk about, uh, and then 10,000 people died. In a lighter note, puppies. Yeah. Uh, but that's kind of what we have to do here. Essentially. I guess the opposite of that. Right. Um, we have to talk about the McVeigh tapes. It's hard to do, but I, you know, I don't want to drag anybody down. So we talked about Willard, and I'm going to try and keep this a little light, even though this fucked me up a little bit more than it should have. Yeah. 
I mean, this is a pretty straightforward documentary. They don't really start exploiting witnesses for emotional value until, you know, the end of it. Uh, but just something about the guy and about the event kind of fucks me up a little bit. This is uh, the McVeigh tapes, the confessions of an American terrorist, is something you're probably going to have to get on BitTorrent. Uh, I know MSNBC has clips of it streaming on their site. We watched it on YouTube because mm-hmm. that's the, the only way it was available to us. It aired on uh, MSNBC. It was something that Rachel Maddow helped put together and uh, it came out right around the 10th anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombing, which was April 19th. Uh, I know that because also Waco and the American Revolution stuff that came up, right. as you know, you see in the film. It's based largely on the American Terrorist book, uh, the one that it's apparently the only authorized biography by Timothy McVeigh, or not by, but of Timothy mm-hmm. McVeigh. I'm not really sure what makes that a sanctioned authorized biography. I guess Timothy McVeigh yeah. talked to them, and right. that's you know what it is. But that was done by two of the people we see interviewed at length in the film, uh, Lou Michelle and Dan Herbeck. So before we get really deep into all this stuff and talk about Timothy McVeigh, there's a really strange, you know, a lot of times when you see these TV documentaries or, uh, you know, just documentaries in general, especially with lower budgets, they will use dramatizations done by actors. Right. So we have something a little bit different here. Yeah, something weird. They they use facial super mega recognition CG technology picture Photoshop paint. it's called. Yeah. Adobe Photoshop, it's what we make our album artwork with. And they uh they kind of pasted a weird CG version of Timothy McVeigh's almost face over somebody that looks more like Timothy McVeigh than the CG does. Yeah. And then they just used kind of stills. Yeah. Um and I understand the point, and I guess it's it's effective in the wrong way for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, All right. Well, Explain because that. well, because I think their goal is to make you go look. Timothy McVeigh is doing these yeah. things, but instead, I just go, man, he's just a weird looking guy. Yeah. Well, he's a weird man. Part of it is that Timothy McVeigh looks really fucking weird. Yeah. Even when they get to the footage of him, by that point, I've almost lost the distinction between the reenactment sure. stuff right. and the footage. Right. Uh, but he's he's just so fucking weird looking and yet, that maybe really the first normal. time to test this, yeah, to test this footage might not be, or to test this technology might not be on someone like Timothy right. McVeigh. But I'm going to say a step in the right direction for these dramatic, you mm-hmm. know, recreations. Yeah, for sure. I think the idea of filming it and then pasting his face over there, uh, and the reason I think they use a lot of that almost Ken's burn type, you know, here's a photo, we're zooming in on it, they're doing it in rapid succession. I think that's not just part of the style, but that makes the animation a little bit easier, a little bit more believable. The few times we get actual, you know, live streams and not low frame rate kind of stuff is when we're looking at feet or somebody's back or something like that. But you're trying to tell a story. You're trying to make a narrative out of this event. And of course, Timothy McVeigh can't fucking act in it. And sometimes when you have these dramatizations, I mean, name a good dramatization in a documentary. They're all terrible. They're cheesy. I mean, this one's still a little bit cheesy, too, because the CG stuff is so weird. Right, right. But I think by comparison, this is definitely moving up. Not perfect yet, but you mm-hmm. would agree that a step in the right direction. Yeah, for sure. So a lot of times when we uh, cover the documentaries, we end up giving our take on how the events transpired. Oftentimes, we will talk about a skeptical kind of uh, angle on right, an event. Right. Or when we did Waco, we were just trying to figure out what the fuck happened with Waco. Um, a lot of the documentaries, that's sort of our position on that. But I think I'm just going to assume most people know what happened with Timothy McVeigh. Although I didn't, I don't know how familiar you were with the events. I was, I remember that. it happening. Yeah, so, right. I mean, I remember. It's, I wasn't old, but right. I do remember it. I remember seeing it on TV. Yeah, but I had a, a different uh, picture in my head of how the events transpired because it's been so long. But, uh, he, you know, he was a domestic terrorist, an American-born terrorist, which is apparently a big deal, although I think terrorism is fucking terrorism. But that's part of what makes this such a standout story. And then, of course, the carnage he unleashed. A guy who went through the military, had some anti-government uh, sentiments, created, a, what was it, a 7,000-pound 7, bomb, bomb Yeah, out of this truck, which I also, that was one of the things that really shocked me is seeing that he spent four hours sitting there building that bomb and then slept in the truck and then had to drive. I mean, he was driving the bomb. And then I, I know we were both kind of shocked looking at that tiny yellow truck 
and seeing that it took out half of that. I mean, he intended it for to, to, to take out the entire building. Yeah. But, you know, it right. took out half of that building. I mean, the kind of carnage that was unleashed there. The myth I had in my mind was that this was a two-man job. Somehow I remember back to Oklahoma City, and maybe it's part of that initial reporting, you know, who they mm. were looking for. It was two men that yeah. they were looking for. But the documentary certainly centers on Timothy McVeigh as if, what does he call himself, the, the principal of, mm. uh, of the attack? And then these two other guys who had, you know, a little bit to do with it. But there are people that he met in the Army at Fort Riley. Well, it was uh, Michael Fortier and Terry Nichols, right. uh, both guys who had some hesitation, you know, afterwards. So I guess the big question that I want to just launch into, first of all, the context of this when, uh, you know, Rachel Maddow narrates it, and it was put together by an entire crew mm. of people, huge fucking crew people. But I, at the time when she was doing her nightly news program, uh, she's an anchor on MSNBC, she was trying to set up the context of this and the reason that it has relevance today as, you know, we were in the middle of this big healthcare debate and we were starting to see the rise of the American Tea Party movement, you right. know, as they call themselves. And we won't go into a big tangent about what the Tea Party is, but some of the rallies were starting to get violent. It's something we saw around the election and we saw it come back in full swing with healthcare. People very upset and making these sort of threats on people's lives. At these rallies, they're talking about taking their country back as if it is gone from them. They're talking about how the government has gotten too big, maybe sentiments we could even agree with. But do you think there is this this relevance of, I mean, essentially what she's setting up without directly saying it is that we could have another event, another homegrown terrorist event, as they'll call it, uh, like Timothy McVeigh out of one of these movements we have now because of how violent. I mean, do you think it's possible we're heading in that direction or is that sensationalism? I think it's sensationalized mm -hmm. to a very large extent. I think that if anything, the Oklahoma City situation would serve as evidence against it. So if you, have, if you have a movement of people, mm -hmm. I would imagine that that's... An, okay, so give me a hypothetical number of people involved in this movement. Give me a small movement. Okay, a small uh, local movement? Sure. Mean? Okay, so let's say there are 40 people. 40 you know, people. Let's say a local militia, right? All right, fair enough. Okay, so the Oklahoma City bombing situation, mm -hmm. there were three people involved. Right. Two of which backed out because their better senses took over. Yeah. And the only and the reason that the one ended up succeeding was not because of necessarily he he could have done it despite the other two people. Mm. He it would have been harder, it would have been a lot more difficult and possibly he may not have been able to pull it off. Yeah. Now, if you take that and multiply so that's 30, if you multiply that Multiply that by 13. That's 39. So 40 people. Think of how many dissenting people that would multiply. If you have a if you have a 33% rate of violent people, and this is a gross study because it right. wouldn't be one out of three. It'd probably be one out of 1,000 yeah. or one out of even 10,000 people that would actually go to fruition with a violent plot. Right. You have 40 other people that would not only dissent, they would back out, and even even one of the three in the Oklahoma City case went to the authorities. Well, I, I think I mentioned Columbine earlier. Um, that's kind of a, a good example of that, is after Columbine, you had a lot of focus in the media. A lot of stories came out about hypothetical school shootings, or school shootings that were foiled, I guess I should mm -hmm. say. And I don't know that there were necessarily more back then. I think the reporting was just greater because of the tragedy that happened right, at Columbine. Sure. But what you saw very often is that kids would try and involve large groups of their peers, 20 different people to man all the exits. And inevitably, those those kids, most of them, would come to a staff member. They would go to a, a, exactly. an authority figure, the police. Sure. And that's why that's why I think that great movement, specifically the Tea Party movement, which is disgustingly large, mm -hmm. that could never... It, if something violent were to come from a Tea Partier, mm -hmm. it would not be under the condonement of the entire movement. Right, you know what I mean? Do you think it's possible that that fosters someone like Timothy McVeigh, for instance? I mean, is it possible maybe the entire movement wouldn't start a revolution? You know, they would love to believe that they start a revolution, sure. but you know what I mean. Specifically, they wouldn't organize together and say, all right, the 40 of us in this local group, you know, the mm -hmm. example we used, uh, we're going to band together and create a bomb. Maybe one goes to the gun range with these people and practices on a weekly basis and they decide to go off with two other members 
and I mean, do you think that that would happen without these groups? Are these groups perhaps are they a danger? I guess is the question that, I, that comes no, up. No, I don't think they are. I think that by becoming a movement, you're you're automatically dispelling your ability to become violent right. in the sense, that, especially in the Oklahoma City sense. You have to be secretive. So it sounds like you think that. Sorry to cut you off. No, it's uh, fine. It sounds like you think that that violence comes from the people. Yeah, the individual. Absolutely. And you're saying the group would foil that rather than this kind of hypothesis that's thrown out that perhaps the groups create violent individuals. No. I think that I think that, again, and I'm trying to use the Oklahoma City case because that's right. the right. thing in question here. But I think that Timothy McVeigh found his conspirators and not that mm. his conspirators created him. His influences and in that in all of these national tragedies um, that are perpetrated by individuals, the influences, that's always what strikes me. Columbine. That's what I'm interested in. What happened at Waco when we talked about it? It was how did the events happen? You know, when these tragedies come up, I'm interested in why did they happen? And I think we get a lot of insight about Timothy McVeigh of all the way back from, you know, what may be a misnomer, but maybe not uh, about when he's in school and bullies and his opinions of, of mm-hmm. jocks, his time in the army. You know, it's when he's in the army. And this is something that's really strange to me. Part of his disillusionment with the government comes from being in the army and murdering other people. Mm -hmm. To hear him talk, and that's what I think is strongest about this documentary, is that they have the tapes. Right. To hear the man's voice, to hear his actual words, even though it's cut from hours and hours, Mm -hmm. it's very selective. To hear his actual words describing things like, you know, how he killed people in the war, how that was celebrated, and how he had to take a second and think, wow, I just killed these people how terrible that my government would condone that the blatant hypocrisy in that. I mean, that's got to just blow your mind when you hear it. Oh yeah. You know, that's what's astonishing about that tape to hear him say straight faced, not even realizing that he himself is the Oklahoma city bomber Right. that, you know, he has a problem with this murder. So how do you reconcile those things? Well, apparently he's watering the tree of something with the right. blood of someone. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's just say it that way. Can we say that watering the tree of something watering with the, the blood of someone? <laughs> right. So, Bullshit is what that is. So what you're saying is he's taking this Thomas Jefferson quote uh, completely out of context or at least to an extreme that it's yeah. not intended. He doesn't understand it. You know, tree, patriots, liberty, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to kill a bunch of people. Yeah. You think he just has backwards ideas about patriotism? Well, I I mean, I think that I'm not sure anybody has forwards ideas. About <laughs> right. Patriotism. All right. Yeah, patriotism is a weird thing like that. Um, If it sounds like I'm just giving you a lot of questions, that's because I completely agree with you about a lot of these things. Maybe I should state that. Yeah, I don't think that these groups are, you know, that's a kind of freedom of speech thing. Tea parties can organize or whatever. I don't think you can really start saying that these, the violent rhetoric is creating violent individuals. But I am, this is the part that really, that kind of hits close to home and makes me uh, almost a little nauseous. Uh, Just not concerned but that upsets me i mentioned that this was something that kind of upset me the first time i watch it you know that thomas jefferson quote i mean this all right so timothy mcveigh is a guy he's, he's what 26 or 27 when yeah. he when he did this right 27 i believe the thing that's haunting to me is that here's a guy in his 20s he is our age range he's a fucking skinny white guy he is the 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 thing i, I really want to get at is that he has all these ideas about the government shouldn't kill people the army turns him off, although his army training was important to him. Uh, he thinks the government should be smaller. He thinks the government is infringing on people's rights. I mean, that's stuff. We don't get political a whole lot on this show, but those are all ideas that we kind of yeah, share. about. For sure. That's a libertarian stance, yeah. not to call Timothy McVeigh a libertarian. Yeah. But, you know, when when I'm watching something like Rachel Maddow, it's a very liberal show. And I can look at that and she can say, well, here's somebody who thinks the government is too big and uh-huh. who, you know, believes in the Second Amendment and throw these ideas out that if I'm just to listen to the ideas, I go, well, I think the government's too big mm-hmm. and I think the government does bad shit and I don't agree with the war and I think we should have Second Amendment rights. Yeah. And I'm kind of haunted by what makes Timothy McVeigh different from us because his ideology is so much the same. There, There is a point. I feel like if I had to answer that question, I think we have this simple, it, it's it's one thing. It's a hair away. We have this simple commitment to nonviolence. We both talk about how we're pacifists, how we couldn't murder other people. Mm-hmm. It's just morally not right. 
See, the thing that confused me and, and what I was kind of disappointed by in the documentary is he has a lot of big words. He has a lot of the government is the evil and yeah, and all sure. this stuff, but I don't ever see the details. I yeah. don't, for all I know, the government is evil because, you know, he thinks they're taking children and yeah. brainwashing them and taking them to the skull and bones sect right. of yes. heart. Like, that 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 you're talking about these conspiratorial me. right ideas. i don't know how how i don't know where he lies mm-hmm. in the why the government is evil i know he thinks they're too powerful but does he think that that power extends to mind control right you right. know stuff like that i can't say i identify with and so i don't really know we talked about loose change the 9-11 conspiracy film and that was something that always interests me about 9-11 conspiracies because a lot of that stems from people who believe the government lies to them uh, doesn't believe in what their government's doing, thinks their government, you know, is an entity that is uh, needs more transparency. And I agree with all of that stuff. And then I'm standing right here with a person and I'm saying, I agree with you about this, about this, about this. Oh, wait, 9-11 is a conspiracy. Well, how did we reach that conclusion? I feel like I'm standing in a room with Timothy McVeigh saying, yes, the government is too big. Yes, killing in war is wrong all of these things, and then we go, okay, so we're in agreement, let's blow up a building, and I say, wait a second, what? how do we reach that? Where is the disconnect here? Well, I don't know, have you ever read, okay, so I know we hate doing this, but I think it's about that time. <laughs> have you ever read Mein Kampf? No, I haven't. When you read <laughs> Mein Kampf, that happens. Yeah. You're going, you're along for the ride, you're like, yeah, no, totally, too much power, and this guy was corrupt, and no, I see what you're getting at. Oh, yeah, and the Jews kill that weight. Yeah, right, right wait, how do we arrive at this? There's a gap in here yeah. somewhere. So I'm really curious what makes up that gap. Well, it sounds like a lot of it when he's going to these gun shows and he's meeting with these people. I can I can see it being a lot of him trying to reaffirm these ideals yeah. and finding somebody to just kind of go, oh, yeah, sure. That's all he'd need. Yeah. He doesn't need somebody that actually agrees with him. He just needs somebody that, that plays along. Yeah. Somebody, he says, you know, I think the government's too big. I think someone needs to do something about it. Maybe, like, blow up one of their buildings or something. That'd show him, right? Yeah. Yeah, sure, dude. You gonna buy that? Or Well, especially with the way he talks. Exactly. You know, right, right. Uh, but these gun shows, I don't know. I've never actually been to a gun show. What I always heard from people who went to the gun shows is the big pressure is, you need. it's the same thing they talk about in the documentary. Got a stockpile. They're going to be taking our guns from us. You're going to have to stockpile. And it's almost their selling point. So the other thing that had, that I've kind of found in this gap of how oh, I'm not okay fucking killing people and, uh, you know, and the Timothy McVeigh stuff is not just the army training or the, the, the decision right in killing, but it's some of the stuff you talked about in the minutia of what he thinks in, is it mind control or what, you know, what are the particulars? The few things they hit on very briefly, but I think are really important in expanding on is that he identifies with this militia movement. He identifies with the Branch Davidians as freedom fighters, which mm-hmm. when we talked about that, clearly we don't identify with them yeah. at all. Although what happened there was completely fucked up, but I couldn't see myself in that position. And he, and I think this is the big one, he identifies with the survivalist uh, kind of think that mm-hmm. you know we need to prepare for the end of the world. We need to prepare for apocalypse. We need to always be prepared Helter for Skelter. war. To get back to the original point you were making, tea parties aren't, you know, I've been to rallies that are like tea parties. It was before the tea party stuff existed. But you you remember like all the Ron Paul stuff yeah, that was happening sure. a couple elections ago. And I kind of went to a couple of those things and saw what they were about. And a lot of similar ideas there and stuff that I do actually believe. So I, I think the tea parties are a completely different direction than the kind of, I think if anything fostered, if any kind of group fostered the kind of thoughts that timothy mcveigh had it's people who would endorse like you said hey we should blow up a building right Mm -hmm. uh survivalists people militias people organized around violence they have the central the central concept of violence that they believe in not the central concept of small government i don't think the central concept of small government leads you to blow up buildings i think it gives you an excuse to use these fascinations you have with taking out this opposing uh, side that you're at war with that doesn't really exist. Any way to rationalize your nonsense, man. Yeah, that's what it is. All right, we have a website. That's uh, doublefeatureshow.com. If you want to send us an email, that's doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. You can leave us a review on iTunes. You can go on Facebook. 
Uh, anything else that we need to talk about? Yeah, we're still taking donations for the end of the year show, or yes. uh, a show toward the end of the year anyways. So we're basically going to pick two people who donate, and they're each going to send us a short list of movies, and we're going to pick one movie off each list and make a uh, make an entire episode out of it. So if you have stuff you've wanted to see before on our show that, for whatever reason, we have just refused to do, this would be a really good way to force us to do it. Go to donate.doublefeatureshow.com, and you can send a donation through there. You can also do the subscription donations on there. And not only do the subscription people get an entry into that and a chance to pick out the shows, but they'll also get to record, um, everybody who's a subscriber will get to record a little clip, whether it's through voicemail or emailing us an MP3. And we are going to do a big intro at the end of the show that the theme music is just going to be all listeners. So that'll be amusing. So both of those things are donate.doublefeatureshow.com. Next time on the show, we're going to do The Devil's Rejects and Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. So it's a Rob Zombie show. Uh, We're going to talk really specifically about the movies and not as much about Rob Zombie himself. But if you don't get the Rob Zombie stuff, this is going to cover a huge range. The Devil's Rejects is one of his most popular films. And uh, even people who don't like Rob Zombie love The Devil's Rejects. And then Halloween 2 is probably one of the most misunderstood Rob Zombie movies. And so I think that'll be a good one to talk about, especially for people like Rob Zombie, but maybe didn't get that movie. Great. Watch more fucking film. All right. Bye.